voice is probably loud enough that you'll, you'll be able to hear me. Uh, I was going to tease Tom that I think he has a bright future in university administration with two minutes allocated for one section, three minutes for the next, and there's a, like an assistant provost brother. <laughs> I wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy. Uh, but thank you, uh, thank you for having me here. It's great to see you. Uh, many friends uh, from the community and the uh, Lowndes County Democratic Party. And so I'm going to try to wear two hats tonight. Uh, uh, you can be the judge of how successfully I wear either one of those hats. And I'm going to try to give you uh, a, 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 a political science overview of where we're at uh, in the American South. And quite frankly and quite honestly, what the challenges are for the Democratic Party in the contemporary American South. But then to also articulate what is the path forward. And so uh, the title of my uh, talk tonight, which I've got my timer, so I will uh, get that started. Um, <laughs> exactly a module hook. Uh, my students probably wish they had a module hook often. Um, so the title of my talk tonight is uh, Turning the Peach State uh, Blue, or maybe I should say more appropriately, uh, Turning the Peach State Purple. Oh, well, purple peach might be a bruised peach, so let's, let's just leave it at that. Um, so a historical overview. I mean, what I thought I would start with, and, and it's a story that all of you uh, know very well. I mean, it's a very bright group, it's a very well-read group, and I applaud your activism. But the realignment of the American South is probably the signature political development in this country over the last 60 years. The collapse of the solid democratic South, which, let's be honest, it was a conservative South, it was a Jim Crow South. Uh, it's not a bad thing that that incarnation collapsed. But the collapse of the solid democratic South into a two-party competitive South, and now, my friends, in the 21st century, we find parts of the deep South that looks like a one-party GOP South. Not, not a one-party Republican South like we saw with a one-party uh, democratic South, but nonetheless, there are pockets throughout the deep South, there are pockets throughout the 11 Confederate states that look like a one-party system. And that's a one-party GOP system. You know the story well, right? It began in the 1850s with uh, Southerners voting for Ike, and that was candidate-based voting. They still considered themselves Democrats. With the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the Civil Rights Act, uh, the Voting Rights Act, I'm sorry, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, I would argue maybe the most significant legislation passed in the 20th century, it was a watershed event. When African Americans were finally able to register to vote, finally able to participate, they did in massive numbers in the Democratic Party, and white Southerners defected from the Democratic Party. It is a story about race. It is a story among many white Southerners based upon racial threat, racial animosity, felt the party no longer represented them. Now that's the origins of the 1960s, but it's a more complicated story, right? I mean, you have the rise of the Christian coalition. You had the rise of the moral majority. You had the Reagan presidency where Southerners said, I'm not just voting for the GOP, I now identify myself as a member of the GOP. Uh, black and black, Earl Black and Merle Black, they're, they're brothers, they're twin brothers. One teaches at Rice, one teaches at Emory. They're just so darn cute when they go to conferences because uh, they don't like each other since they're twins. Uh, and they've argued that there's two great white switches in Southern politics. In the 1960s, again, driven by the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, uh, many white Southerners began to vote for the Republican Party, but it was during the Reagan presidency that they began to identify themselves as Republicans. And part of that was the theme of what? Smaller government, a theme of lower taxes, uh, an argument for a stronger national defense. Social issues, of course, have they weave throughout this tapestry from the 1970s to the 1980s into the 21st century. Those social issues being abortion, those social issues being school prayer, uh, those issues involving God, gays, and guns, as they've often been described. They are wedge issues. They are wedge issues um, that the GOP has been able to play uh, with mastery uh, throughout the South. So my friends, after the 2014 midterm elections, if you draw a line from Texas all the way through the Deep South up into the Carolinas, you have what? No Democratic governors, no Democratic U.S. senators, not a single state legislative chamber controlled by the Democrats, and that's never happened. I mean, in the era of the modern GOP, right, Abraham Lincoln to the present, in the modern era of the Democratic Party, we have not seen that kind of unbelievable uh, and, and, and seismic change. The other thing we got to add on top of this realignment is polarization. Right? Many political scientists argue that American politics is as polarized as at any time since right before the Civil War and then right after the Civil War during Reconstruction. And, 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 and that's, not, that's not a pretty story to tell. I mean, 
quite frankly, we are polarized racially in this country, we are polarized in terms of our party, and we are polarized geographically. I mean, there's a lot of fascinating political science research. Uh, there's a book called The Big Sort, and they argue that people are increasingly deciding to live with like-minded individuals that share their ideology. So again, we find ourselves polarized racially, we find ourselves polarized in terms of our party identification, and we find ourselves polarized geographically. And friends, it's not just the elites. Um, I know we debated this uh, just last week in our Views of the News class. Alan Abramowitz, who teaches at every university, I'm not trying to push his book, I don't get any royalties, but Alan Abramowitz's Alan Abramowitz book is called uh, The Polarized Public. And he argues that if you are frustrated with the polarization in your legislatures, look no further than the mirror. There are plenty of moderates in the electorate. There are tens of millions of moderates in the electorate, but they do not vote, they do not follow politics, and they have not been mobilized. And so if we look at the base of the contemporary GOP, and we look at the base of the contemporary Democratic Party, we have polarized, we have very ideologically polarized party bases that pick candidates in what? Primaries. And so if we look at the polarization, that often comes out of our primaries, it's, it's the party base. <laughs> I'm not here to jack anybody. Again, I want to repeat, I applaud your political participation. I applaud your political energy. But I think we've got to keep that point in mind about a path forward when we talk about plenty of moderates out there, but they are disengaged, they are tuned out, they are turned off, and this is what uh, Tom uh, was nicely noted earlier. So again, we all know the story about the Republican realignment of the American South and where we're at now. And now I would argue we not only have polarized elites, but we have a polarized public. And we find ourselves in the 21st century highly polarized because of very ugly racial gerrymandering and partisan gerrymandering. And that's, and that's a key issue, right? I and mean, if you look at how we have drawn our district lines, particularly for the United States House of Representatives, that's another explanation for how we find ourselves racially polarized, party polarized, or ideologically polarized, and then geographically polarized. For example, just a quick, a quick bit of trivia, if you look at Republicans in the U.S. House of Representatives, their districts are an average of 78% white. So let me repeat that. For Republicans who serve the United States House of Representatives, their districts there are on average 78% white. Now, is the United States 78% Caucasian? Not even close. Nowhere is near that kind of number. But again, that's the, that's the kind of polarization that I'm talking about. So how do we move forward? How do we move that peach state blue? Or how do we move that peach state uh, purple? Well, I have five uh, paths forward. Um, now, folks, I don't have a magic answer because if I did, or if there was a magic answer, people much smarter than I would have already implemented it, and you would have seen much different election, electoral outcomes uh, probably over the last um, uh, several cycles. But what I can emphasize is a first point, and I say this to my dear friends, is that it's not just about demographics. Right? Now, I think there's an argument often made in democratic circles, and I just wanted to share some, some tough love tonight. There's an argument that, well, because of changing demographics, this state will inevitably go democratic. Or because of changing demographics, the South is going to inevitably return to a democratic stronghold, or at least more of a balance. Well, my friends, not so fast. Uh, some of my colleagues at Georgia State University have done very interesting research about the demographic changes in Georgia from the 2000 census to the 2010 census. And what they argue is that the democratic share of the vote, particularly in statewide elections, should be much higher. It should have been much higher between 2000 and 2010, given the demographic changes. But it has not transpired. And folks, this is nothing new to anyone in the room. But it's not just about demographics. It's about what? It's about mobilization. It's about activation to voting. Let's go back to last year, 2014. The Georgia Democratic Party, as well as local county party organizations, did an impressive job in terms of registering new voters, in terms of registering minority voters. But if you look at the data that Tom was sharing with us earlier, uh, Michelle Nunn finished with what? 45% of the vote. Jason Carter finished with about 45% uh, of the vote. Uh, if you go back and remember Roy Barnes's campaign from four years ago, he was at about 43% of the vote. Uh, not a huge difference. Or again, not the kind of change we would have expected given, given demographic shifts. If you remember Jim Martin, now important caveat. 
This was in 2008, uh, of course, back in a presidential election. But uh, Jim Martin, as you may remember, the Democrat in the U.S. Senate race, garnered about 47% of the vote. So the demographic change, of course, it can be a key predictor. But it is about not only getting individuals registered to vote, but mobilizing them to vote and getting them to the polls. And again, I'm just echoing what Tom, I think, emphasized so eloquently earlier, um, that it don't, it don't matter if they don't vote. It don't matter if they don't get to the polls. Um, so beyond that, beyond that, it's not just simply demographics. It's also about turnout and activation. Uh, the second point that I wanted to make is that Democrats are simply unbeatable when they build biracial coalitions. Again, quoting Earl Black and Merle Black, two of the leading scholars on Southern politics, we know that Democratic candidates are going to garner what? About 90 to 95% of the African American vote, around 60% of the Latino vote. If they get 30% of the white vote, they need not get a majority of the white Southern vote. But if they get around 30% of it, they are darn near unbeatable in elections across the board. Well, let's take Michelle Nunn, for example, then. Michelle Nunn's strategist would tell you that their goal was to get 30% of the white vote in the general election, and they wanted the minority vote to be what? About 30% of the electorate. Well, friends, they achieved the goal that minority votes were about 30% of the electorate last November. They did not go hit that target of getting 30% of the white vote. In fact, Jason Carter and Michelle Nunn, if you look at the exit polls, they got around 23, 24% of the white vote. What Alan Abramowitz has emphasized at Emory is that the Democratic share of the white vote in the South continues to drop. It's dropped for decades. It continues to drop in the 20th, in the 21st century, and we don't know what the bottom is. I mean, we, we don't know what the floor is. Well, how do you reverse that trend? How do you build these biracial coalitions? And friends, I would argue that's part of your solution to polarization. If you want to talk about transcending polarization, you get elected based upon what? A very healthy percentage of the Latino vote, a very healthy percentage of the African American vote, and maybe 30, 35, gosh, even 40% of the white vote, right? I mean, those kinds of biracial coalitions, I think, are not only good for our elections, they are ultimately good for our public policy. So how do we get there? How do you arrest that decline in the white vote? How do you build biracial coalitions? Well, that leads me to my next point, or my third point, which is that Incorrect voting uh, is something that we all have to be cognizant of and that as a party we hope to address. Now, political scientists, I love this term incorrect voting. Incorrect voting is let's say you have an individual. Let's say we have a white female or a white male. It doesn't have to be white. They can be Latino. They can be African American. And they find themselves between jobs and unemployment insurance is helping them survive between jobs. Their children might be receiving government-backed health care insurance, and maybe they're going back to the technical college and getting a degree, and that's because of government-supported financial aid. But when it comes to voting, they're what? A GOP voter. And so when political scientists talk about incorrect voting, which is most acute in what region? The American South and especially in the Deep South. And again, that may sound like an arrogant term. Well, who are you to say it's incorrect voting? Well, what political scientists mean by incorrect voting is this notion that when it comes to economics, right, when it comes to pocketbook issues, you should predictably, at least by our modeling, be a Democratic voter. But you are not. You're a GOP voter. And that might be because of social issues. It might be because of, it might be because of wedge issues. Whether those wedge issues range from gay marriage uh, to uh, issues such as charter schools uh, to issues such as guns, but it's social issues that often what? Trump, you voting for a party that quite frankly advocates policies and promotes policies that, that serve you. And so I think wedge issues are part of the explanation, but my friends, you know what also is part of the explanation? is pure and simple political socialization. Our parents have a huge impact upon our party identification, and as the American South has realigned, right, as the American South has realigned, you have more parents passing on to the next generation uh, a GOP party identification. And what I would suggest, and this kind of leads into my next point, what I think can be our most powerful weapon against quote-unquote incorrect voting is to win the battle over ID is to win the hearts and minds of individuals in terms of public policy. And that leads to my fourth point, that I think as Democrats, we can win that idea battle. We can win uh, the hearts and minds. And in France, I think many of you have been sharing this amongst yourselves. The Atlantic, just last month, 
The Atlantic Magazine ran a fantastic article entitled, uh, What's Wrong with Georgia? One of the points made in the Atlantic article is that Georgia is quite frankly a low wage, low tax, and low service state with one of the highest unemployment rates in the country. So let me repeat that. The central conclusion was that Georgia is quite frankly a low wage, low tax, low service state with one of the highest unemployment rates in the nation. Since 2003, $8.3 billion has been slashed in this state from public school funding. So from since 2003 to the present, what, a little more than a decade, $8.3 billion has been slashed from public school funding. A sweeping tax reform bill in 2012 eliminated key sales taxes, such as the sales tax on energy used in manufacturing, and it also broadened tax exemptions uh, for the agricultural industry. Quite frankly, friends, in the last year to two years, this has wreaked havoc upon local governments, especially small cities and small counties. Um, these local governments have been forced to do what? Slash their workforce. They have been forced to raise property taxes. Let's take an example here. Valdosta raised their property taxes recently for the first time since what? 1992. And let me emphasize, and again, I'm stealing this from the Atlantic, so I, mean, I don't want to be accused of plagiarism. But what the article notes is that, look friends, what attracts and retains businesses, what attracts and retains businesses are not these gimmicks of the tax code, but rather a commitment to an educated workforce, transportation infrastructure, public safety, reliable street cleaning, a myriad of factors along those lines. Take the issue of the defunding of transportation. I think many of you remember the, de the debacle that was t right? The state legislature did not want to deal with this pressing public policy issue, so we carved up these little regional zones. They each voted on a t tax. I believe it was rejected in, what, nine out of 12 regions, most significantly in the Atlanta region. And friends, I understand all the problems with t -splos. I mean, I'm not trying to make an argument for t -splos. but what it shows is a state legislature, a GOP-controlled state legislature that, what? did not want to address this issue, was happy to pass it along to the voters, and then watch it, what, be resoundingly defeated. And what is the top issue right now in our state legislature? Yes. Dealing with transportation, and are you seeing a variety of gimmicks? Well, we yes. need to raise taxes, or we need to raise funds, but we don't want to talk about doing that. Anyway, it's, it, it's this type of public policy debate that leaves you scratching your head, or pulling out your hair. That's why I have very little left on the top of my head. These are the kinds of arguments that I think Democrats can win on transportation infrastructure, on an educated workforce, on supporting public education. Of course, because of ideological battles or ideological fervor or polarization, Georgia has elected what? Not to participate in the advancement and expansion of Medicaid in this state, even though we have seen in other southern states that it can bring down costs in that state and expand coverage. Kentucky is a nice example. Um, what Democrats can do, I would argue, my single point here is that Democrats can win the battle of ideas on sound public policy positions for an educated workforce, health insurance, improving transportation infrastructure, and my goodness, supporting our local governments, supporting our local governments who provide critical public services, who provide critical issues in public safety. Friends, fundamentally, we get what we pay for, right? Or, or, or we get what we don't pay for. And again, I keep coming back to a state that's low wage, low tax, and low service with an incredibly high, we tend to alternate back and forth with Mississippi in terms of who has the highest uh, unemployment rate. Uh, joke is you don't want to be uh, jostling with Mississippi on those kinds of measures. Um, and folks, we need to look no further than Kansas, Ohio, and Wisconsin. Right? Just keep in mind those states. Kansas, Ohio, and Wisconsin, who have <coughs> largely dismantled their tax system, crippled funding for their local governments, and those three states now find themselves awash in what? Bond downgrades, the inability to fund education, and also local governments that feel like they are hung out to dry. Friends, and I guess this is where I, I proselytize or stand on my soapbox, but Georgia can do much better. Georgia Democrats can win 
this battle of ideas on education, on workforce development, on transportation, uh, on supporting our local governments, because it is a system of federalism that you all remember from your introduction to American government course. It is not a unitary system, and it's not a confederation. It is a federal system that critically depends upon those in Atlanta not crippling the tax base of local governments, but working hand in hand with those governments. And I think that's where essentially Democrats can win. And my final point, so beyond the point that it's not just about what? It's not just about demographics. Of course, demographics are important, but it's mobilization and turnout that are critical. Secondly, we have to be able to build these biracial coalitions. We've done it in the past, we can do it in the future, and it will trump polarization. We need to address incorrect voting. We can make incorrect voting correct voting in terms of people's economic needs and their pocketbooks. And then also we can win this battle of ideas. When it comes down to the all critical job creation and economic development, I think the Democrats have the stronger ideas. But my final point, and I think this is where we're coming, is that quite frankly, it is a time for change. And I know sometimes we hear that slogan thrown out without a lot of meaning, or it seems like rhetoric, but I think that is maybe the strongest arrow uh, in the Democratic arsenal moving forward. You realize, right, that by the year 2018, I know that seems like a long ways off, only four years, three years, by 2018, the GOP will have controlled the governor's mansion for what? 16 years. They will have controlled the state legislature and both chambers for almost that same amount of time period. It is a powerful time to say, look, we need a new direction. We need new ideas. We need new public policy initiatives. Um, and I think that this part of the uh, landscape is where Democrats can, can seize the high ground. And friends, it's not just about tax and spend. And I want to make that clear, because that's not only a label that has worked against the Democratic Party, but we're much more than that. On none of these issues am I suggesting, well, we just need to tax a whole heck of a lot more, and then we need to spend a whole heck of a lot more. What I'm arguing is that creative, innovative solutions on everything from workforce development to transportation infrastructure to our education system, those can, will, and have been put forward uh, by Democrats. That, that fundamentally, we should be thoughtful and deliberative in our public policy, right? Uh, not going for the quickest tax cut gimmick that we can offer to businesses, and businesses don't stay. They simply do not stay. The economic development is crystal clear on this. That if your only policy on attracting businesses and keeping them here is tax cut gimmicks, they do not stay. The Democratic Party, as Tom so eloquently noted earlier, can provide a hand up for those that are near the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. Uh, the Democratic Party, I think, can make a clear message can make a clarion call to those individuals out there that have needed the support of public services or the government or certain programs at certain times in their life, that this is a party that is there to support them, that this is a party that is there uh, to provide them the opportunity for the American dream and the opportunity to advance. And it's also a party that stands for victimism. It's a party that is not looking to leave state governments. And again, I go back to that Atlantic article. You have small cities in Georgia that have eliminated their police force. Right. So, I mean, this has been their solution. Uh, when we see eliminating the sales tax on energy for manufacturing, when we see massive tax exemptions for the agricultural industry, you have a smattering of local governments across Georgia that have eliminated their police forces because they have no other options. And they don't essentially have a tax base to jack up property taxes. What kind of a system is that? It's not a system. It's not an effective pathway forward. So that time for change is here now. These are the individuals that I think can move that forward, and it is a future that I think can be can be very bright. So if the peach is not blue, it at least can become a purple peach sometime uh, in the in the near future. Um, I think I hopefully stay within my uh, within my time constraints, um, and I would be I don't know if you if we if you want to take some questions or some observations uh, that that you might have. But again, thanks for having me. I have an observation. One moment. Um, we were just at uh, the state committee meeting um, in May in Georgia, and one of the things they were really talking about is the transportation bill, where they're suggesting that they're going to take our three pennies of SPLOS, LOST, and E SPLOS away from us uh, from the gasoline. 
So they're going to take those three pennies that we pay locally on gasoline, and they're going to put it into the general fund. That's how they're going to fund transportation. Every single person in this room, everybody that you know, needs to call every legislator that you know and say, that's our money that we uh, said we would tax ourselves. You can't have it. Well, Gretchen, thank you. Well, <laughs> uh, Gretchen, that, that is exactly what I'm talking about. What is, what is the path then for the GOP? The path is meant to defund. It's meant to defund local governments uh, or to raise that pot uh, to, to pay others. Thank you, Gretchen. Well, basically, you want to say that taxes, local governments will have to raise taxes to replace that revenue, which is a huge mess because Valdosta, for example, is only taxed a bit of territory while well, well, the county can tax the whole county. You know, it, it's a big mess. We don't want it. Ask anybody on the city council. Right. My point was going to be that um, there's a set of related issues that converted whole families last year who had never voted Democrat to do that. Some of them voted for Tom Hushjob. You know what I'm talking about. It's related issues of property rights water, and the environment. The form it took was this party and its candidates and other candidates' opposition to the Cycle Trail Pipeline. Those are issues that are not necessarily the ones that you mentioned, but they cross all the lines, what you mentioned. Yes, sir. And they did succeed in converting people. Now, mm -hmm. unfortunately, what we were really liking last year was turnout. There's right. a related issue that seems to be working for Mr. Obama now. Mm -hmm. He's finally speaking up on it. Have you noticed his popularity rail levels rising? And what's one of the things he's been actually speaking and doing was about climate change? Right. right. That is, yeah, uh, amongst Democrats, it's huge. Even amongst the other party, it's actually about 50 50. Amongst independents, it's a pretty big margin for. And the form that's currently taking is Georgia, Georgia's legislature is HP 57. Finance solar panels on your roof, thus bringing your electric bill way down. And people in this county that pay 200, 300, 600 dollars a month, this will let them get out from under that, pay much less, and then my son's 10 years to pay it off. And it's local jobs right here. It's jobs, it's climate change, it's energy. All, all winning issues that Democrats have been giving away. No, thank you. Well, well put. And I, I focus just because of my fascination with the Atlantic article and, and Jason Carter's recent campaign. Uh, but, but thank you, John. Well put. I mean, issues ranging from property rights to environmental issues to climate change. These can be the underpinnings of not only, again, building these. Because I mean, let me just repeat. I mean, uh, throw a black, throw a black, make real point. Democrats are unbeatable in the sense that they build these bi-racial coalitions. They simply can't. Turn out. It, well, not exactly. And, and turnout is the key underpinning. That. Uh, but these are the issues that can be uh, the key, I think, to winning these elections and to building those coalitions. Thank you. Yeah, it's not, it's not just economic development. I wanted to point out uh, uh, the fact that uh, the taxation system in Georgia, if you ever look at your sales receipt that you get at the counter, counter when you buy some items, you'll find out that you have like a 6% state tax and then you have a local 3% tax. Those two tax together, that's 9%. Um, there's no room for taxation with me at 9%, aren't we? Yeah, although I would argue, I mean, even if you look at uh, even if you look at sales tax issues, uh, Georgia is still Georgia is still comparatively low compared to uh, compared to many regions across the country. But also keep in mind, if you're not willing if you're not willing to address property taxes or other taxes, where do you make it up? I mean, you can often make it up on the taxes. And those are highly regressive. I mean, I appreciate your point. I mean, I mean, one of those regressive taxes we can have, right? I mean, those taxes that most penalize though, those near the bottom of the social economic ladder are sales taxes. So yeah, if, I, mean, I appreciate your point. If you're unwilling to look at other uh, tax systems or tax adjustments, then you try to make it up in sales taxes, which is deeply regressive and, 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 and deeply painful. But they do it without your knowledge. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm trying to, oh no, I guess what I'm trying to argue is that if you look at the overall tax burden in Georgia, if you look at